the second suicide attempt, I remember I was playing with the boys in the backyard and she came out of the house holding her head and talking about how bad it hurt. Asking herself, you know, what have I done? What have I done? I had one of the boys call 911 and just held her in the backyard until the paramedics arrived. We were in a wicked gunfight. One of the things about it is snipers only fire three rounds and then we move. And then we fire three more rounds from a new location and then we move. And so the last time I moved, I moved to dead center of that gunfight and I told my partner, stay inside the building, I'm not moving again until I'm dead and this gunfight's over. That's when the AK-47 round hit me in the head. The bullet that hit me just missed the bridge of my nose and exited over my left ear. So it took all the bone in my eye and everything with it. He were bruised and his face was shattered and he could, could hardly talk because his teeth were loose. I mean, he was really, really bad shape. Obviously, you're thrust into an unknown situation. You are not prepared for the complexities of medical care. You're not prepared for the bureaucratic hoops you have to jump through. And so I'm trying to acclimate myself and be as much of a help to him as possible. I'd taken a two week leave. I was not going to leave him when he needed us the most. And when I say us, he needed his children to be there. It was the holidays, I'm not leaving his side. He didn't even remember his pin number for his debit card. I mean, he, he didn't have access to his own money because he couldn't remember anything. I had to help him with every element of his day-to-day -day existence, let alone assist in his care. So things compounded one on top of another on top of another. I had three children that needed attention. They were going through a huge transition. I mean, imagine you know, uh, uprooting three children in the middle of a school year to go live in a hotel somewhere with a dad that has half of his face missing. That's a lot for any child to absorb. So they needed extra attention. So I'm trying to be as much of a good parent as I can possibly be. I'm trying to be as much of a, a caregiver as I can possibly be. I'm trying to satisfy all the demands financially. I knew I was in a crisis. I knew that I was heading down the wrong path, that depression was setting in. I wasn't sleeping well. I wasn't eating well. I wasn't taking very good care of myself. I was under this extreme amount of stress. Just all these layers of stress that you're trying to juggle simultaneously. And there's no human that I know of that can do that and not break down and at least cry. I was diagnosed by Dr. Hassan as being bipolar, that I had a severe mental health issue. I feel that medication could have helped me if it had been prescribed correctly and monitored correctly. I felt that if I had a say in my care that it would have gone a different direction. That I know myself better than anybody else. And if I know what I need, I need that practitioner to hear me. I wasn't going in asking for drugs, I was going in questioning the drugs. I was made to be the crazy one. All I knew is that my immediate need could only be resolved one way. Because I had tried everything that I knew to do already. I felt in my limited thinking and limited reasoning and limited judge, judgment capacity that um, I was doing a favor to those around me. I felt that um, the kids would be better off. If I was such a bad mother, they would be better off with another one. I felt that if my husband was so unhappy with me as a wife, that he'd do better if I just cleared the path for somebody else to come in and take my place. I opened those bottles and I gulped down as many as I could and I washed it down with a little bit of water and I sat down at my computer because I didn't want to confront you. I just simply wanted to just disappear. I wrote him an email 
And I basically said, I am not worthy. I feel that you deserve better. I feel the children deserve better. And that my place in this world, I don't have a place in this world. I simply have no value. Therefore, I love you, but goodbye. And after they had pumped my stomach and I started coming to, and really kind of looked around, saw where I was and what was going on. I mean, um, you kind of in and out of reality in a situation like that. And I looked across from me and there was an old man who had people around him. One was combing his hair, one was holding his hand. They were showing gestures of kindness that hadn't been afforded to me by anybody. And I wanted it. But the ultimate gesture is he looked at me and he smiled. That was the first time anybody smiled at me like I mattered. And he gave me a little wave. And I sat there and I said, Tori, you're so stupid. It wasn't your time. There's a reason why you're still here. There's a reason why that man across from you just smiled at you and waved at you. An elderly man, probably fighting for his life, who took a few moments to smile. And so it's really hard for me because um, I feel a lot of shame and a lot of guilt. I know that if I had all of these things happen to me right now, I'd at least have the coping skills to deal with it. I'd be able to get through it. I deal with a lot in my life right now. I really do. But I can deal with it because somebody was willing to listen. Somebody was willing to offer the help I really need, not the help I didn't need. And it wasn't planned to have two white horses. It just happened to be that way. Right. There's just something sexy about seeing my husband riding on a white horse. <laughs> my knight in shining armor, riding him on a white horse.